So our final speaker before we open up to a dialogue is Leslie Trigg. She's the CEO of Outset Medical. She's been there since 2014, and she has expensive experience in the medical device and tech space. And I think you'll really enjoy some of the innovation that she's bringing uh, to, to the area. So, Leslie, let me get you out of this. Great, okay. Yeah. okay, so um, I'll start with the two most important <coughs> comments first. Um, one, I'm an adopted Packers fan. Um, my husband's from Wisconsin. Two, I am really glad I'm not the CEO of an OPO right now. Um, <laughs> so, um, so that's a win. Um, I, I am the CEO of a technology company, and I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in the conversation because so far we've talked about care delivery model change, patient-centered care change, um, service model innovation going upstream. And uh, I want to make the case that technology can play a really important role in helping enable everything that we've just been talking about. Um, so my, my thesis here for you is, is that we see technology as an enabler of service model innovation. That's what we're here to do. We're not here to produce technology just like a little bit better than something else. The idea is to use technology to enable a very, very new model of care. So that's what, that's what we're about. So what can technology <coughs> broadly deliver? And I'll get to an example of how we've thought about it in the design of our device. Um, but as I thought about it, I, I think technology can, and I'm talking about technology in the physical world or the digital world, so let's, let's define terms. Um, I think it can deliver flexibility to this space, by the way, in, the, in this space. Um, the, the where dialysis is delivered, when dialysis is delivered, who can deliver dialysis, who can receive dialysis. I think adding flexibility to this ecosystem is really powerful, too. Um, I think technology can deliver agency. I think we, 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 we're thinking and talking a lot about patient-centered care. What are they lacking today? I'd argue that patients are, are lacking agency. On, it's our belief that technology, not technology alone, by the way, we'll get to that in a second, it's technology plus a community that can, can restore agency uh, back to, to patients. So we, we are talking about patient-led care. And third, I think technology can deliver insights. This is probably the most obvious. Um, customize care through data and data analytics. And so, so I'll give you an example of that with, um, with Outset and, and, and the device that we've been working on called Tableau. So to translate flexibility, agency, insights, here's how we thought about it. And this was, by the way, in 2012. Um, this company was started in late 2010. So it's taken us nine years to get here. But, but uh, when I got involved in 2012, we took a big step back, and um, I think like most of us would do, what are we really trying to do? What, what doing the root cause analysis of what's going to make the biggest difference. And so some of our observations, some of you may agree or disagree, we were all, our whole company was new to dialysis. We were all coming from different aspects of, of clinical medicine and, and medical device. So we looked at it with a neophyte's eye, and it seemed to us that infrastructure requirements were driving a lot of the, the cost and the inflexibility of the way, where, when, and who was delivering dialysis seemed to be wrapped up in the infrastructure requirements. Could we do something about that? The strategy then became, well, let's use technology to decouple dialysis from infrastructure. Then you get to the how do you do that, and that ended up being way hard and a lot of money, but we'll get to that later. Um, the second uh, big picture observation we had is, you know, gosh, if you look at um, other areas of medicine from diabetes to COPD, people do appear happier and healthier when they have information and when they have control, real or perceived control, right? And there's a, there's a large body of psychological evidence about perceived control, uh, but I won't get into that. So, so our thesis was people will be happier and therefore healthier if they have information and control. Our strategy became, okay, could we use technology to democratize data flow? What I mean by that is putting the data and the information in the hands of many as opposed to the hands of the few. And two, could we use technology to lower the cognitive impediments to autonomy, i.e., could we make things a whole lot easier? <coughs> so, um, so I'll tell you just as one example of how these ideas 
um, the, the insights and then the strategy got translated into a device, just as, as an example of the framework. So we got really excited about a technology-driven way forward. That's what we're, we're good at, and it takes a, oops, a community of, of caregivers and, and service providers around a technology to make it work for sure. But this is what we thought we could bring to the party. We thought we could make a technology that was simple, um, that decoupled dialysis from infrastructure, so we did that effectively by combining a dialysis machine with an entire water treatment room in a 36-inch box. So that, that was kind of a translational idea one. Two, we wanted it to be on demand. If you're talking about flexibility of when and where, it really should be something that you turn it on, press go, and you're going um, with, without a lot of setup and, and time involved. So um, this device purifies water and makes the dialysate in real time. That was the how. The, the third how was, well, if we want to democratize data flow, we better make sure it's connected. And so we made something that has two-way wireless data transmission, and we are located in California, which I'll admit. So we, we do have, I would say, um, a sort of obsession with um, AI. I'm not ever going to say AI for the rest of the talk, because um, it's a very overused term. But, but we did build in, early on, uh, a pretty interesting data platform behind it in the service of democratizing <laughs> data. So that's how that, um, the framework and the root cause analysis gets translated into the how behind device technology. Um, so I want to maybe just switch gears before we start the discussion and talk about our current landscape because my unique vantage point in this is as a technology developer. I've never been in the services space. My background is mostly in coronary and peripheral vascular devices. So I think the advantage I have is I've seen device technology and, and adoption of new technology in a bunch of other spaces outside of renal. And I'll tell you when I got to renal, I was shocked. I was shocked and not in a good way. Um, so, by my count, this is rough numbers, um, there are about 7,000 medical device startups. That's the best number that I could find. Now, I could actually think for myself about nine device startups, but I wasn't sure I knew everything in the entire world, so I doubled it. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have to triple it, so that is an estimate. I think out of 7,000 medical device startups, there are fewer than 20, and possibly fewer than 10. <coughs> And I'm not talking about equipment. I'm talking about little catheter caps and a new kind of needle and a new type of fistula creation. I mean, the whole space of renal, of, of ESRD, has t less than 20 startups in it. And you look at, you know, ca cardiovascular. I mean, the cardiovascular patients have freaking hit the lottery. They've got new devices coming out, you know, every single month, every single quarter, every single year. Don't we owe that to this patient community? So, so I want to talk a little bit about, okay, how, this is the current state, so I'm not going to leave, we're not going to stay here. Um, we're going to go into future states. So what is needed to increase innovation broadly? And as I thought about this, and I thought about this a lot, um, we need three things, and really one plus two equals three. Well, one plus the second one is equals two. Anyway, um, we need an entrepreneurial ecosystem. That means we need more entrepreneurs. I think the Kidney X program is going to be a great start fostering kind of these micro startups and individual entrepreneurs, patient entrepreneurs. Um, we need more entrepreneurs interested in inventing in this space, but I, and I'm not worried about that. Two, I'm a little bit more worried about this one. We need an early adopter environment within the space. So here's my ask. Um, we need more early adopters. And that starts with physicians, and it starts with nurses, and it starts with technicians, and it starts with the owners and administrators of care providers. So what does it mean to be an early adopter of a new technology? Um, I will reflect a little bit and share what I've seen in other spaces in the OR, in the cath lab, robotics, stents, mitral valves. Um, and I'm not defending this, but when you go into other spaces like this and you're looking at new, new devices, I have never seen one that was not imperfect for the first period of its life. Um, and, and so I was accustomed to being in a cath lab using, and I won't cite the device, because this device went on to become the market leader. But the first many times I saw this device work, it had a little battery-operated handle, and like the, the, the handle was smoking, um, tips would fall off in the tibial perineal artery, and patients were in a surgery, robotic systems, the arm was getting stuck in the patient, patient was going to uh, uh, open surgery immediately. I mean, this is thousands of cases. Again, I'm not defending that. Um, but as a result of it, you have you know, ORs and cath labs, that care community that has developed the muscle memory around problem solving and area of progress. 
to be an early adopter, you have to fight the urge to fear. That's a human instinct. I, I fear it. It's new. Oh my God, what if it doesn't work? What if it's not scalable? What if we can't replicate it nationwide? What if nobody wants to da 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 da? That's very human. But you have to fight the urge to fear if you want to be an early adopter. If you guys want new technology, you can't fear it. And two, you have to embrace the possible. <laughs> and, and three, you, you've got to be ready to iterate. And, and help, the help on the device side, help your community uh, problem solve along the way and believe ultimately that you're going to get there together. So, so denying the fear, overcoming it, um, and embracing the art of the possible. That's to me what, from what I've seen, it means to be an early adopter. We need a lot, a lot more of them because if we don't have one and we don't have two, I will tell you for sure you're not going to get three. And if we don't have more capital flow into this space, you won't have more startups. Unfortunately, it takes a, an enormous amount of money, whether you're talking about a new little needle line or you're talking about an implantable. We're talking about, you know, xenogenesis, I can't even blah, 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 blah. That's not a $10 million project. <laughs> hundreds of millions of dollars. If we are ever going to get to that level of innovation, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. And in my experience, talking to lots of investors, um, people aren't so excited about pouring hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into a space that's perceived to not have one and definitely not have two. But the good news is our hands are on the wheel. We, we can do something about one and everybody in this room can do something about two. So that's my ask because I personally want to see three. I think everybody in this room wants to see more startups, wants to see more technology, and that starts with, with capital flow into the space. So thanks for the opportunity. So that was pretty awesome and perfectly on time, I must say.